And we're back for another edition of the Six P's podcast. We're delving back into the longest memory, and we're going to be looking at chapter seven today, entitled Lydia. As the chapter suggests, this is from Lydia's perspective. She's Mr. Whitechapel's daughter, and it's the first of three chapters with her name. Her initial encounters with Chapel are documented in this chapter, including her teaching him how to read and write. And of course, we already know part of this from the previous chapter, chapter five, Chapel. Uh, in this case, we get a little bit more detail and it's written not in verse as Chapel's is, but in prose. She explores the forbidden nature of education and the implications of teaching Chapel to read and write. And throughout this chapter, it's a bit like a couple of vignettes, a couple of short stories describing different days. So it's a little bit diary-like. It starts with the phrase, this is the day. And for me, she's almost reminiscing on happy and positive memories. So again, shifting in tone from, say, Sanders Senior's chapter and looking at a more upbeat, loving tone in this particular chapter. When looking at the key themes for this particular chapter, once again, we'll be looking at racism and discrimination particularly when it comes to education. In fact, we'll be looking at this over the next couple of chapters in a row. Memory, family as well. I guess love ties into that too, given Lydia and Chapel's relationship. And you've also got the themes of freedom and equality, particularly when it comes to, again, it was the law that enslaved humans were not allowed, were forbidden to read and write. And this will be explored throughout, not just this chapter, but probably the next three or four chapters which are predominantly from Lydia's perspective. Chapter seven, Lydia. I begin as his big sister. His hand comes into mine and I clasp it without thinking. I lead him to a chair. This is after I watch him for days out of the corner of my eye, edging his way into the reading room. The scratching at the open door is him, half in, half out. I look at the words on the page and listen. What should I do? A call comes from his mother in the kitchen. He leaves this gap at the door. I listen. There is a sound of his scratching. I look around, but he has gone to his mother. I must have heard the memory, the words swim on the page. Another day he wraps his leg around the door and swings it while balancing on the other leg. The door is slightly ajar. He slips his leg around it and begins to push and pull at it. I look at the words on the page and do all I can not to reveal my smile. This is the day I'm reading and waiting for him to appear. I half close the door, hoping he will look in the room after entering by pushing the door wide. I look at the same page and wait. Perhaps I should have left it open altogether. Maybe a smaller gap. I want him to see all he needs to see without entering the room. The thought makes me change my chair so that my body is sideways away from it instead of facing it as before. When I sit down and glance at the door, I see he is there watching me. I look down at the page, breathe in deep, push myself to my feet and march over to him. He takes a step back. My smile keeps him there. I signal him to come forward but he does not move. I decide to return to my seat. In the few steps to my chair, he's beside me and I feel his hand come into mine. I sit and read aloud. He sits across from me. I look up, but not much. His mother calls. He waves and scampers out of the room. I mark the page where he had to leave and close the book. I begin to read from a different book. I just pull off the shelf without reading the spine. This is a day I decide to teach him to read. Not because I want to, but because he leaves his seat to stand beside me in order to look at the page as I read. I edge along to make room for him to sit. His face lights up. He perches on the corner of the chair and leaves a gap between us. I make sure he can see by leaning a little towards him. I read aloud from his usual book, which I keep near to him. Next thing he is sitting properly, both legs facing the front and leaning over to me. His lips are moving, as mine move, without a sound or at least without a word sound since I detect the hissing noise he makes 
as he parts his lips and breathes through his mouth. I take his hand, hop closer to him so that our legs touch, and point his index finger to each word as I say it. There is more light on his face and a broad smile. His mother calls from the kitchen and he waves on his scramble out of the room. I put my finger to my lips and hiss. He nods and runs, dragging his feet on the smooth floor. I mark the page where he left off and take up another book. I read. This is a day he says some words aloud for me when he recognises them. The same few words. I skip them when I get to them and allow him to hear himself. He says them all with the same exhilarated voice. He is close to shouting them. I smile and he looks away. I bury my smile for him. He is at ease again, joining in with his handful of words. His mother has to call his name twice before he hears. He runs off fast to catch up with the good boy who heard his name the first time his mother called and who is already out of the room. This is a day he reads to me. Not a few words, but page after page with occasional help from me. Now I am the one he pauses for now and again as he reads. I recline in my chair and let his voice cascade over my body. He watches me as he reads, so I close my eyes to let him look without my gaze meaning his and acting as an interruption. This is the day I open my eyes in the middle of his reading and realise how foolish I have been. Foolish and selfish. I've taught him to read, yet he cannot write his name. I open my eyes so rapidly I catch him staring at me. I sit up. He glances around, thinking someone may have surprised me. Surprised us? You surprised me, I want to say, but just smile. I tell him now that he can read, he must learn how to write. He nods with vigour. But before I do anything else, I make him swear to keep these occasions to himself. He swears readily. He swears because he is prepared to do whatever is asked of him in order to learn. I feel awful for making him do it. There is no other way, unless we forget the whole affair which is out of the question. I guide his hand through each letter of the alphabet and stop at W. Your name begins with this letter, mine too. Well, my surname or last name, W for Whitechapel. His mother calls him. He frowns. Chapel, she says. Chapel, a second time, without waiting for him to answer. Then she complains loudly about always having to call his name at least twice to get a response. He does not answer until he is well clear of the reading room by which time she calls him another couple of times. I once asked her why she breathed out her, her son's name. She said because she calls it and her husband is around, both father and son answer. So a really short chapter, as the next couple are actually. So we'll only look at five quotations for this one. The first one is the first line, I begin as his big sister. We've got that sense of equality. Lydia has a very different outlook on enslaved humans and the other characters do, particularly some of the things that her father says in his chapter, Mr. Whitechapel, chapter two. Clearly she doesn't have this superiority, inferiority complex. She treats Chapel as an equal, as seen through the metaphor of being his big sister. Also suggests, I guess, the platonic nature of how the relationship starts. It's through, you know, the reading, the text, the education, and their sort of, you know, intelligence that draws them together. Uh, you can also look at their names, I guess. They, they both are, to an extent, Whitechapels. Second quote, I look at the words on the page and I do all I can not to reveal my smile. This goes to, I guess, their love and particularly the forbidden nature of their love. They have to keep it a secret. And in fact, she says again on page 81, you know, I, I bury my smile from him. This notion that, again, having to, to keep things secret, having to hide true emotions throughout this text. And even the quote, you know, I bury my smile, the word bury even is deliberately used. Again, dramatic irony here in the fact the audience knows, unfortunately, that Chapel is going to die. The next quote, there is more light to his face and a broad smile to showcase the benefits of teaching him, Chapel, how to read and to write. And just that motif of light and even the word bright that comes up a few times to reflect the goodness in the world. You've got 
The next quote, I recline my chair and let his voice cascade over my body to reflect the love between the two characters. And the last one, I make him swear to keep these occasions to himself. He swears because he's prepared to do whatever is asked of him in order to learn. And I feel awful for making him do it. So there's a two, two things I sort of want, wanted to raise here. The first one is identity in family. Sort of here, Lydia is acting a bit like her father, trying to sort of keep things on the quiet. Uh, again, to, to hide things that are considered illegal or forbidden. But I also wanted to raise it for, for gender and how, although she's not enslaved as a woman in this patriarchal society, she's still under the control of her father. So women are either under the control of their father or their husbands. So here we see particularly her being quite concerned about her father, as she will be a little bit later on in this text as well. So given it's a short chapter, there's not a whole lot to compare with the seven stages of grieving, especially, I guess, evidence wise. But I reckon Lind Lydia's remaining chapters will provide you with some good detailed evidence you'll be able to use in your essays. Two points to think about, though. The first one is the importance of education, particularly for those who are disenfranchised. It provides them with a voice. So in this case, Lydia teaching Chapel how to read and write is empowering. This is very different to the play, though. In fact, language is taken away from First Nations people. So it disempowers them, really. C9, Black Skin Girl, you can look at the woman who is in the stage directions depicted as being childlike. She attempts to evade the letters that appear on her dress, the English alphabet letters. In fact, she has to remove her dress in order to sort of escape it. And you could also look at scene 10, Invasion Poem. In fact, we've looked at this quite a couple of times, but it's a good one. It's told not to speak, not to dance, told not, not to do what we'd have always done. So removing language and the ability to communicate in order again to disempower people. You could look as well at while education yeah, definitely does empower Chapel, it also leads to his demise. And given that we already know about his death, there's a bit of dramatic irony there. The second point to think about is the reliance on allies in seeking change. And Lydia, as we'll see across the next couple of chapters, is, is really important because she's able to speak up and speak out. In fact, she speaks to the newspaper in chapter 11. So consider Lydia's continual support of Chapel and her activism particularly in her letters to the editor, and compare that to the reconciliation movement in scene 24 of the Seven Stages of Grieving and the optimism of something like the Rainbow Serpent, that, that imagery on the Sydney Harbour Bridge and what that, that sort of does. So again, the fact that there is a need for greater community support in order to seek change.